it's almost sort of like when you write history about this issue, it's like a Rorschach test, right? And so sure. people who are progressive read these kinds of histories and say, oh my God, you know, this is terrible. What are we going to do? And people on the right read the same history and say, you know, good job documenting how we made these heroic efforts to change yeah. America. <laughs> Hi, this is Frank Schaefer, and this is my podcast, In Conversation with Frank Schaefer. And today my guest is historian, professor, and author, Mary Ziegler. And Mary is the author of After Roe, The Last History, uh, sorry, The Lost History of the Abortion Debate. And we're going to be talking about a lot of stuff. And of course, I can't think of a title more apropos of our moment of history than After Roe, The Lost History of the Abortion Debate. Um, and it's going to bring up a lot of stuff. So first of all, uh, let me just say welcome, Mary. Thank you for coming on today. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And I gathered a moment ago that you're in California and you're a professor. Um, where and what are you teaching? So I teach, um, I'm the Martin Luther King Jr. Professor of Law at uh, UC Davis. And um, I teach law. I mean, I teach lots of different kinds of law school classes, um, but I'm as you mentioned, mostly a historian of the U.S. abortion debate. So I've written, I guess, five or six books at this point about it. Um, still write and writing another one that's under contract now. So, yeah, and unfortunately, you're not going to run out of material. It's ongoing. Um, you know, <laughs> right. Share that. If someone had told me when I got out of the evangelical right wing movement in the early 90s that um, whatever it is, 30 years later, we would still be talking about this. Um, I would not have quite believed it. I would have said, well, you know, that was interesting what we were doing, but it's long gone. And by then, of course, things will have moved on and they have not. Mm -hmm. Not at all. No. Just tell me that. Tell me a little bit about the background of how you um, stumbled into or or chose to be someone who writes four or five books on the issue of abortion, Roe v. Wade, American politics, such as it impacts this debate. What was your journey into this issue? Well, I, I, in part, it was, I think, how I grew up. I grew up in a pretty Catholic community in Montana, um, but I knew a lot of people, both who were pro-choice and pro-life, so I think mm -hmm. I found that somewhat interesting. But I, a lot of it was just that there wasn't that much history on the post row period. So when I was in law school, I was taking a legal history course at Harvard, and uh, there was a lot of kind of questions about, you know, how does the law change or not change society? And I was waiting for the book about Roe v. Wade. We'd read books about Brown v. Board of Education, which was the, the famous desegregation decision. Sure. I kept waiting for the Roe book and we didn't ever read it. So I asked, uh, you know, my professor at office hours, like, basically, like, what's up? You know, <laughs> Why didn't we read the book about Roe? And he said, well, there, there are books about how Roe came to be, but there aren't really books about what happened next. And mm. so um, I just I think I started writing about it just because I was curious. Right. I had been waiting to read this book that didn't exist. And so um, I think that's really how it started. Um, I think this is an area where there's obviously a lot of very brilliant people writing about it, but they tend to be writing about it more from the perspective about what the law or the world should look like. And there wasn't as much on you know, what, what happened? Like, how did we get here? Um, and I think that I, I wanted to know those things. So I started writing about them. And, and when was that? And what would have been the first thing that you did? Did you, were you writing essays? Did you do a PhD? How did um, this? Oh yeah, I, I don't have a PhD, which is weird. I, I did um, a postdoc at Yale. So when I started, I think I started writing and researching about this around 2007 when I was a law student. And then I did a, a postdoc at Yale um, and worked with uh, Reva Siegel there. Um, and then I, I just sort of started writing books. I mean, my first book came out uh, in 2015. Um, and then, you know, I think as is often the case when you start studying something, the more you write, the more you realize you don't know or you haven't sure. said or doesn't make sense. And so that I continued writing about it. What, what were the kind, just if you off the top of your head, sorry to put you on the spot, but in, in okay. the order in which you wrote them, what are, just toss the titles out there of the books that you've written on this. Sure. So I wrote Abortion After Row, the one you mentioned in 2015. Right. Um, and uh, that was primarily focused on the 70s, but it was about what I thought were kind of myths surrounding, um, yeah. you know, the world that Roe made. I wrote a book called Beyond Abortion in 2018, which was about, um, in part, how the idea of a kind of right to choose or a privacy right connected to Roe 
had been used in all these struggles unrelated mm -hmm. to abortion for about a decade before uh, the abortion wars heated up more. Yeah, I wrote a book called Abortion and the Law and with Cambridge University Press in 2020 that was sort of about um, how the a history of what happened between Roe and 2020 that mm -hmm. was focused mostly on these fights about what the reality of abortion is in American communities and for families, less on, you know, fetal rights or rights to choose, mm -hmm. but more on just kind of is abortion good or bad and how that came to the courts. Uh, then in 2022, I, I published a kind of textbook for students called Reproduction and the Constitution. I also published a book that's on my behind my head, uh, Dollars for Life and the Anti-Abortion Movement and the Fall of the Republican Establishment, which was about how the anti-abortion movement got heavily involved in the politics of campaign finance mm. um, in, in a bid to kind of transform the Supreme Court and have Roe overruled. And I have a book coming out uh, in 2023 that's timed to be what would have been the 50th anniversary of Roe. Uh, that's called Roe, the History of a National Obsession, which is about sort of why people are so fixated on Roe, even when the abortion debate, you know, has sort of moved beyond it, when the law had moved beyond it in some ways, even before the Dobbs decision, um, where that came from. When did you write that last book? I'm just sorry to interrupt you, but oh, when sure. were you writing it? Um, I was, it was an interesting time to be writing it over the past couple of years. So, I mean, I, I didn't, I knew that Roe was going to be overturned when I was wrapping it up, but Dobbs hadn't come down yet. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I have the new project I'm working on now that's under contract with Yale is um, a history of the American fetal personhood movement and, um, you know, what its ideas are about what equality means and yeah. how it became so focused on um, criminal punishment as opposed to other ideas of what a person could be or what personhood could require. Yeah, I mean, there's so many places I want to talk with you about, but just sort of author to author, let's stay with the books for a minute. Um, what has been the reaction and how have your books been received? Have any of them sold very well? Have you been on all sorts of TV stuff because of it? Are you called on to do talking head things from everybody? Do <laughs> students come um, to you to study and take courses because they know you've written these and they're interested? I, I'm just interested. Yeah, I mean, the right, what's the impact on your life? having done all this work for all these years? Well, so, I mean, I get less hate mail than I would expect. Um, and I don't know what to make of that. I mean, I get some, but less, I think, than, I mean, I think some of it is probably because I'm white. Um, but I think even in 2015, when the first book came out, I, I sort of, I was began to be consulted by the media um, to make sense of things. But as you can imagine, when it became clear that the court was going to overrule Roe. Yeah. There was an explosion of interest in this there. And um, it's been, you know, there's sort of like not a day that goes by when I don't talk to reporters. Um, and and what, what about the result in terms of, say, people running for office and or movers and shakers within the Democratic Party? Uh, calling on you for a little advice or? Yeah, or that, that, that's happened a lot more in the past um, probably couple of years. Again, I think. Um, People in general have cared a lot more about this issue in the past couple of years, and that's tracked with, you know, how much people have um, sought me out. And that's true, I think, yeah. you know, in the academy, in the media, w among political leaders. Um, and I think it, before, I think there was also some, you know, because I wasn't doing advocacy yeah. as overtly. I mean, I do, I do amicus briefs as a historian, um, but I, I'm not, you know, doing work that's like just about abortion being should be legal or illegal or whatever. It's mostly, while I certainly have views on that, um, my scholarship is mostly about what we learn from the history. But I think in recently, you know, people have not known how this happened basically <laughs> they want to make sense of what happened and um how we got here and so there's been a lot of interest in that do, do you find yourself looking forward to some point in your life if ever uh moving on in the sense that the toxicity of the issue itself and the way it's handled and the kind of people you're writing about in terms of let's say the federalists or these other folks and the way they raise money and jenny thomas and touch it wherever you like um, it, it, it's it's rather toxic because a lot of these folks, first of all, are rather disingenuous in the way they present things. And so you you might find yourself mired in 
uh, a kind of a negative subculture a lot of the time in just in terms of the kind of investigative journalistic aspect of what you're doing. Do you get tired of this? Um, I mean, not yet. I, I think, I mean, in a way, because it's depressing, um, but I think it's, I feel like I sort of have a responsibility. Um, yeah. And so, and also I think there's, there's an element of intellectual curiosity in the sense that I like to write about things I don't instinctually sure. understand. I think, um, so I think that that's still there. Um, the sort of, um, the, like you said, investigatory part of it, when you sort of want to figure out why things yeah. are happening or what people are doing, I still enjoy that. But um, a lot of it does come from a place of feeling like, you know, I, I should be doing this, whether or not. Um, no, no, I understand. It's just, you know, you pay a certain price for the kind of, you know, things that you are writing about or looking into. And I'm, I'm wondering, for instance, in Dollars for Life, the anti-abortion movement and the fall of the Republican establishment, um, I think I've I've read your writing on that in terms of um, some some opinion pieces and things, or maybe they were excerpts from that or reviews mm -hmm. of it. But I've seen that, and I'm wondering what's the state of that book right now, and who's reading it, and who asks you about it. Well, um, that got so. I mean, again, I think as as I was saying, um, I've always you know, like most academics, you're primarily read by academics, but then I think because I was read by enough academics, I would get to write, you know, lots of op-eds and places sure. people read these sorts of things. Um, Dollars for Life came out right around the time Dobbs was decided. So it was reviewed, you know, in the New York Times and it got a lot more attention. Um, yeah. Interestingly, and I don't know what to make of this, right? But people in the anti-abortion movement have not really been upset by the book, which tells you a lot, right? Like Jim Bopp, who's, I guess, the main character in the book, sure. thought it was great, you know? And um, I mean, I, I wrote it, obviously I interviewed him many times for the book, so he didn't, there were not a lot of surprises for him in what I was saying. Yeah. But um, the response, I think, <laughs> it's almost sort of like, when you write history about this issue, it's like a Rorschach test, right? And so sure. people who are progressive read these kinds of histories and say, oh my God, you know, this is terrible. What are we going to do? And people on the right read the same history and say, you know, good job documenting how we made these heroic efforts to change yeah. America. <laughs> right? And so that, that's been largely the response, the sort of Rorschach test response. I mean, there, there, you get, you know, some people who are just angry that, you know, anyone is saying anything that isn't just the anti-abortion party line or that, yeah. you know, women are saying anything at all. Like you do get the occasional just like, I'm not even sure if the people are opposed to abortion, but just sort of garden variety misogynist emails about women in public life, which I think most likely may not have anything. I mean, some of those are just yeah. people who are kind of Trump supporting people who hate women. I'm not really sure you know, how deep their, their views on abortion really run. Um, but I, I would say generally that's been the response, a kind of, um, you know, you see what you want to see kind of response. In, in your own formation, uh, just, uh, you know, as a human being coming from whatever background you had, just tell me a little more about yourself as a context to your work on this issue you know, I think you probably know a little of my story. I came out of an evangelical right-wing background that had a lot to do with the anti-abortion movement in the 1970s and early 80s, mm -hmm. had a huge change of mind and have drifted very far away from that background and then have written quite extensively, I guess you could say, in opposition to it and, and so forth and so on. So, you know, that's my journey. Um, uh, at the same time, with a great deal of love and regard in memory of my parents, who were very supportive of my wife, Jeannie, and I, when I got her pregnant at 17 and 18. We've been together ever since. So there's a lot of personal stories that inform the public stand on these issues in terms of trying to explain my own journey to myself. And I'm wondering if you could just take a few minutes here, and I don't want to ask questions that you don't feel like answering, but you know, who are you when you're not doing this? What were your parents like? What's your background like? What, what sort of, how, how do you see yourself? What's the context? Yeah, so my, my dad is, um, is Catholic and my mom is Jewish. And so there were at various points in my life, folks who were, you know, fairly conservative pro-life Catholics, although I think most of them evolved away from that um, by my adulthood. But by the time when I was a kid, that was still definitely in the air and my mom's family was pretty progressive and pro-choice and Jewish. And so my community where I grew up was very Catholic and conservative. So um, I think they're, I mean, not conservative in every way politically, but certainly sure. conservative on social issues. 
And so um, I, I was sort of, I think that made me curious about why people believed what they believed because I wasn't raised in an environment where you could take for granted that your view was the correct view, right? Because sure. the, I was surrounded by people who didn't, um, didn't agree. My dad is a, a professor. So I, um, a French professor. So he was, uh, I, I think I was also always sort of taught to question things. So mm. I wanted to understand what made people tick. I think I often, even when I was a kid, I, I was a history nerd from the beginning too, but I grew up in this, you know, old mining town, Butte. Um, that sure, I've been is, there. Uh, yeah, I mean, and it's, it's one of these places, like a lot of kind of post-industrial places in America that really had had its glory days in the past, which if you grow up in a place like that, you become fascinated by the past because the present isn't so exciting and the past clearly was much cooler. So I think I was always interested in both in what made people tick and in um, history. Uh, and then I went to uh, boarding school when I was 14, I think in part because I didn't feel entirely comfortable in Butte. And I think where, where that, was the boarding? Where was the boarding? It was in at Andover in Massachusetts. Oh, well, and you're so, up, up the street from where I live. Yeah. By the way, I went to boarding schools in, in the UK, but I was being sent from Switzerland, having been in a, a failed homeschool environment that my parents were a little too busy to pay attention to. So what age? <laughs> when were you sent off? Or uh, not well, sent I, off? I, I went sounds voluntarily. Wrong. So I'm actually oh. really close to my parents now. Yeah. I'm an only child. Um, they actually live up the street from me. Um, oh, that's great. But, I didn't, I hated where I grew up, right? I think it was, um, it was, I think like a lot of places where there's there's some real poverty, there was a sort of celebration of, of people being mm. anti-intellectual in part because people weren't succeeding and were struggling, but I, I right. personally felt very out of place. And then I went to Andover where there was, you know, a lot of money and a lot of people who'd had a lot of tutoring and a lot of education I hadn't had and also felt out of place. So I think, that also stayed with me as a historian that even um, I want to, I think, again, wanting to understand people, because I think for large parts of my life, I felt, you know, that I, not that I always got along with people, but I didn't really feel like they understood what I was like. Mm -hmm. I didn't feel like I could be myself or was understood. And so I think that made me want to understand historically, even people I didn't agree with, right? Um, which is usually helpful, but sometimes not, right? Because yeah. to point, sometimes you don't want to understand people or when you understand what you understand is disturbing, right? Yeah. Uh, but I think that, so I, I went to Andover for all four years and then I went to Harvard for uh, undergrad and law school. And so Boston was sort of a second home. I was there for a long time and uh, then um, I guess, you know, if you're fast forwarding, I was a law clerk for a while. I did my postdoc at Yale. I met my husband when I was there. Uh, we got married when I was working at a little Catholic school in St. Louis called St. Louis University. Um, I st stayed there for a while and then moved to Florida State. And we had, I, I'm an only child with an only child because I really liked being an only child. So we had my daughter in 2017 and we moved to California um, last year. So that's- Was good. your husband sort of on an academic track as well or a law track? No, not at all. It's actually really nice. Um, he's, uh, he works um, at the moment for um, a company that does uh, Nielsen, you know, that the, does the TV ratings. Sure. Um, he's always worked at the kind of intersection of like IT and programming and sales. So yeah is absolutely nothing to do with law or politics or history, which which is nice because um, then we can not talk yes, about Yes, absolutely. I get that. My wife does not have anything to do with what I do and so shall it be, uh, although she's helped, helped me a lot on a lot of projects. But uh, what, what's your daughter doing these days? Where is she? Is she well, in, she's five. So she's just uh, started kindergarten. She's doing one. Yes. Um, yeah, she's great. I mean, she's really, she's smart and um She's biracial, which uh, makes it a lot easier to be in California than it was in Florida. Um, so I think that's been nice, just because it's not unusual here. It's not something people. Yeah, like. it's not. It's not so 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 odd. Yeah, I, we're kind of on the same thing there. Although my youngest granddaughter right now is eight, and so when I'm done here, I'm picking her up to take her to a soccer match that where she'll watch her little brother, who's eleven, play. And so I've been in the last. 13 14 years of my life I've been in the little child loop again because all my kids are grown up and um, mm -hmm. that all happened but um, you know I hang out in the playground while I do the pickups and talk to the moms and the dads and a few other grandparents there aren't too many guys doing what I do in terms mm -hmm. of child care but definitely 
get where you're at. Okay, so back to, uh, thank you for that personal history. Really interesting. Yeah, and both of your parents are alive and well? Yeah, they are. The, like I said, they both live down the street. And, and they um, moved to you to be near you? And yeah, they did. Um, well, they, my dad had had some health issues um, and we've always helped to take care of, well, not that they need it, but we'd help them with, you know, I'm a lawyer and, you know, so sure. I help them with that sort of thing. And then uh, when my dad had had health issues that forced him to retire, we had been helping him through the re rehabilitation process for, for yeah. that. And they it made it easier for them to live near us. And then moving to Northern California was not a hard sell because it's nice. <laughs> yeah, of course <laughs> yeah. it is. How is he doing now? As um, he's fine. I mean, that was some time ago. He had um, septic shock, which I, I'm not sure if you're familiar, but it's, sure. it can be really dead. It's what killed um, Jim Henson. Yeah. Uh, and he, he survived it and is actually more or less fine now. Um, he, you know, works out every day. He's pretty mm -hmm. active. So, um, but I think that whole experience made us want to be closer geographically. Absolutely. Just... And, and I, I'm sure they don't object to the being up the street from their granddaughter. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And she, she loves that too. Yeah. Isn't that wonderful? Mm -hmm. Yeah. My son, my son, uh, John served in the Marine Corps and fought in Afghanistan and Iraq and came back, went to the University of Chicago came back to our town, married, moved in with us for two years while they got on their feet financially. But his first child was born while I lived here. And now he's bought a, a house very nearby. So we're basically within walking distance of these little grandchildren we help with. So anyway, I get all that. And I'm very glad for you and your parents because that's a lovely, lovely thing. Um, back to the issue here. When, when you were looking at the, the history of this and how it all came about, you know, has there ever been a point where you've met any people on the other side of the issue where they have made any kind of an argument to you that I wouldn't say has changed your mind on anything, but where you sort of walked away with a sense of respect for the way they had come to their conclusions, however much you might disagree? Or do you or have you found, especially obviously in the present tense of the MAGA movement, Trump and all that, um, that uh, the opposition as it is, has been so off the chart that you haven't had that level of respect for it. I, that's, I'm not fishing for anything here. I'm just interested in how it's been working with all these folks that you've interviewed and so forth. I mean, I think some of the people who were active um, in the early and mid seventies, hmm. I could understand, some of them had personal stories where I could understand how they came to their beliefs, right? Sure. And I think some of them, um, I think really struggled. So I was thinking there's a gentleman named um, Warren Schaller who'd been the very briefly the executive director of the National Right to Life Committee, which I'm sure folks know is one of the largest national sure. abortion groups. And he was, um, you know, very progressive and very opposed to abortion. And I think those things flowed naturally from one another for him. And um, listening to him kind of try to make sense of what was happening to the anti-abortion mm. movement later when it became so removed from any kind of thing you could call progressive and figuring out what that meant for him in an identity terms, whether that meant he had to leave the movement or whether that meant he wasn't progressive or what exactly mm. he was supposed to do with all this. Um, I think I, I, I found a lot of those conversations interesting because, you know, not now I think you can be, there's a lot of consistency in terms of what most people who identify as pro-life are going to believe, how they're going to identify politically. Sure. And so it was interesting to me as a historian to see that, you know, in the past that wasn't always true. And there are people mm. who's thinking, especially I would say people who are not, you know, leading the movement, right? If you just sort of are down in the weeds yes. like with someone in your community who identifies as pro-life, they may not think what you think they think. And so doing interviews, I think, was helpful that way, um, you know, just in reminding me that, you know, whether you agree with people or not, you can't stereotype them um, and not yeah. everyone will be identical. Um, but I think, uh, you know, the the more recent the history gets, the more depressing it's become, right? Sure. I think so. Um, I, I think the kind of less demoralizing interviews I was doing tended to be from earlier mm. time periods, right? And the closer to the present you get, uh, the more the kind of thing you uncover is not encouraging. Yeah, I, I knew somebody very much in that category um, as your friend or the person you were speaking of there, uh, Nat Hentoff, who was the yeah. music critic and jazz critic for the Village Voice. Nat and I were friends back in the, in the 70s and the 80s, and he actually sort of disagreed with our evangelical reasoning against 
uh, abortion, but he was staunchly, I, see, I don't like using the term pro-life because he believed that the abortion issue was something that the left should take up in terms mm -hmm. of human rights. He came at it very differently. It had nothing to do with the Catholic or Jewish background. He was he was Jewish, but um, you know th this was very counterintuitive. And of course, my father himself, if you look at his evangelical orient, you know the orientation of his evangelical books before he wrote um, "How Should We Then Live?" and then "Whatever Happened to the Human Race?" and then we made the film series that played a part in starting the Protestant wing of the pro life movement. If you had looked at his writing up to that point took away the last six years, seven years of his life, you, you, you would know that he was an evangelical, but you would also say the part of him that was most interesting is he was an evangelical interested in art and culture and actually knew something about it. So that, you know, when I ran away from my British boarding school at age 15, he said, let's take some time off. And where we went was to Florence and hung around in the Uffizi. Fast forward to Jerry Falwell, Pat Robertson, and these other guys, this is not what they would do. Mm -hmm. So dad himself got on very much with people like Nat Hentoff. And then there was Malcolm Muggeridge, who was used to be the editor of Punch, so forth and so on, um, turned more conservative. And then there were some of our conservative friends, but not, nothing to do with the MAGA movement or what happened later, like William Buckley and others. They came at it from a sort of intellectual Catholic background, starting the National Review. And I think a lot of folks on the left, or at least you would say a more liberal side of politics, have been too quick to characterize everybody uh, on this issue in, not now, but we're talking in the past as somehow, as if they were uh, part of today's anti-abortion movement. And a, the biggest example would be what happened to Franklin Graham, who's a religious right leader on the far right, a big Trump supporter. I remember sitting with Billy Graham at the Mayo Clinic where my dad was undergoing cancer treatments and, and dad and I were asking Billy to join our anti-abortion crusade, endorsed the movies. He refused. He was pro-choice. So was Criswell of the Southern Baptist Convention. Mm -hmm. Pastor Fe I don't think those facts are convenient to, if you can put it this way, either side, because from mm -hmm. the left, they want them to all be bad guys. And from the right, you know, all evangelicals are crazy. They always have been. Look what they believe in. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, not so. And from the right, they don't want to know that the people who gave them their movement were on the other side of this issue. So, you know, Nat Hentoff, Billy Graham, Criswell, these are all inconvenient to people on their own side. Mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and I think it also, I think people, when they think about this issue, there's also sort of an air of like inevitability, right? That like, of course, this is how it turned out and this is sure. how it's going to be. And the fact that um, there were different ways of thinking about it in the past disrupts that too, right? Um, yeah. And I mean, and, you know, I think uh, that's true of a lot of things. Like if you think about how race was discussed in the context of abortion, sure. um, you'll see anti-abortion folks saying essentially, look, you know, a lot of the people who were in the yeah. family planning movement were racist or the population control movement were racist. You'll see people who are pro-choice saying, you know, essentially a lot of anti-abortion people in the 19th century were going based on some replacement theory or that there were many people in yeah. the anti-abortion movement in the 60s and 70s who were opposed to civil rights. Um, and there, everybody is right, right? I mean, that's that's kind of the irony, right? That if you're looking in the past, they're both people who are inconveniently not bad and also people who are inconveniently bad, right? Especially when it comes to things like um, like racism, where you're going to- Well, or, or, or the overlap with some of the earlier manifestations of the eugenics movement. Yep. I mean, that all really happened. So, you know, it's a tough, it's a tough thing to sort of draw the line cleanly and say, I'm on this side. And it's always, we've always been the good guys, so forth and so on. That in no way means that I'm feeling ambivalent about the issue itself, because I'm very strongly pro-choice, but I came at it from a very odd background, having been very much on the other side. And really, for me, um, uh, the issue itself has always been something apart from the politics of it in that it's sort of two different questions. Um, the how and why of Roe is nothing to do with my feelings about the issue of of trusting women to make choices that affect them and my uh, you know which is to me the heart of the issue you know Roe itself I'm just curious with your studies again this is not a loaded question I just want to hear what you think about this I think there have been arguments from the left as well as the right that Roe was a badly conceived decision and actually set the movement back and of course in view of what happened with Dobbs um 
some of the folks that were saying that from the pro-choice position seem to have more credibility now in some ways. And I wondered where, you know, you know more than anybody else alive right now about Roe v. Wade itself and how it came about. So I finally get to ask somebody who actually knows something this question. I <laughs> yeah, don't. I mean, you know, I think Roe was obviously not the most convincing decision um, and it made the Supreme Court's job easier. But I think if you're looking for a historical explanation as to why the Supreme Court overruled Roe when it did, Roe being yeah. convincing has like pretty much zero to do with it, right? Yes, so exactly. Right. I think you can say that Roe was an unconvincing decision, but then when you sort of lose the plot, like Ruth Bader Ginsburg, for example, um, famously wrote that Roe was unconvincing and that it would have been better if it centered on the idea of, of disc discrimination on the basis of sex. Yeah. But then she said essentially, oh, if the court had decided to roll later or used a different rationale, you know, the anti-abortion movement wouldn't have really got going the way that it did. And the pro-choice mm -hmm. movement was winning at the time that Roe came down. And I mean, I don't think either of those things are true. I don't think you can really say either side was winning um, in 1973. Things had kind of reached a stalemate. And it's certainly not true that the anti-abortion movement would have, you know, read an opinion about equal protection and said, oh, OK, well, you know, in that case, never mind. Um, because those arguments were being made in the states and in other courts and anti-abortion leaders were rejecting them, right? So I think the reason the anti-abortion movement exists is not because Roe v. Wade was an unpersuasive decision or because Roe v. Wade relied on privacy or whatever. And the reason the Supreme yeah. Court overruled Roe v. Wade had much more to do with the way our democracy has changed and the Supreme Court itself has changed than it did with Roe. So I think both mm -hmm. things can be true at the same time. I, I don't think the Roe's, Roe's reasoning helped the pro-choice cause very much, but I think that um, in the big picture of you know what happened to Roe, that was a very small part of it. Yeah, I agree. And having been in at the beginning of the Federalist Society myself in terms of knowing some of those folks and other things, they, you know, their objection to abortion wasn't, you know, the fine tuning of Roe. They they were out to change the entire American legal system, and they've done it. And um, in terms of who they got appointed, and essentially following people's legal careers from the time, even from before some of these kids were in law school, and others, P Amy Coney Barrett being a prime example of someone who was, you know, um, approaches kind of fifth column being placed in a place of power. Which brings up an issue to me uh, that I, I'd like to your opinion on in terms of the actual makeup of today's Supreme Court. You know, I've been looking at this for a long time and have known a lot of the folks involved. Um, and it seems to me that the gloves have completely come off what you might call the conservative evangelical Roman Catholic access in the court. They're not pretending anymore. Uh, and Dobbs is only part of it. Look at the religious liberty cases mm -hmm. that have come down. There's something going on here, which, you know, we're, we're sort of getting into, uh, you know, where it's not hysterical to talk about the fact that there are some people who seem to be pushing for some form of soft American theocracy through changes in the law. And I just want to get your reaction to that. Yeah, I mean, I think the court is behaving very differently than it would have historically. So um, if you look at it, it, so it's not new that the court has a conservative majority. The court has had a conservative majority. Sure. For decades, but I think before there was always um, kind of, at least in, in recent decades, a feeling that um, politics was sort of a check on the court, right? That if yeah. the court did anything that was too out of line with popular opinion, that something mm -hmm. bad would happen to the court, right? Like yeah. the court would, people wouldn't listen to the court anymore, or maybe Congress would strip the court of jurisdiction, or, you know, whatever, something. Yeah. But the, 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 the court had this sort of the idea of a popular backlash looming over its shoulder, and that would limit the kinds of things the court would do, and also how the court would do the things it did, right? That it would, if things were going to be divisive, the court would also, would, would you know, sort of package them in a less controversial way, or would, you know, often decide cases that favored progressives a little bit, and then sure. cases that favored conservatives a little bit, just to kind of maintain you know, the idea that the court was not just a political institution. I mean, as a, as a yeah. historian, I'm inclined to think the court was always a political institution, but the court's desire to not appear yeah. that way had real world consequences. And I think there was a real feeling on the right, um, especially when it came to abortion, but beyond that, that the court's concern with its own legitimacy was really a hindrance, right? And that that was yes. making it impossible to achieve the kinds of changes 
that the conservative legal movement and um, other conservative movements wanted to attain. So they began looking not just for justices who were mm. originalists or who were textualists or who were aligned with the Republican Party, but justices who also seemed um, to be indifferent to popular opinion, right? Who yeah. were either proving that in their actions, right? Like Clarence Thomas's response to the Anita Hill affair, sure. or, you know, just people who said that and acted that way in, in exchanges. And I think that's, that's the kind of court we have now for mm. the most part. There's a lot if you had asked me, and I was wrong about this in print a lot before the court overruled Roe, I didn't think the court was going to overrule Roe this quickly. I didn't think the court was going to overrule Roe in this kind of snarky way. I thought there were ways the court could have done what it wanted to do because the justices are conservative while yeah. conserving the court's power. But the people on the court now don't care about that or don't really mm -hmm. worry that their power will be diminished in any kind mm -hmm. of meaningful way. And that that's all new. <laughs> that's not yeah. something. And that, it's before. new for me as well. You know, one one thing that I kind of remember that was, uh, you know, not a watershed exactly, but a, a kind of a little canary in the coal mine was Bill Barr's lecture at um, the talk he gave at Notre Dame, in which he laid out this idea that the reason we should reelect uh, Donald Trump, and this was, let's see, before the, you know, when 2019, maybe 2018. He gave this talk that actually I talked about quite a bit, um, you know, online and at other places. But, you know, Barr was saying essentially what he did is he he kind of tore the last three chapters out of my dad's book, uh, Whatever Happened to the Human Race, and made the same argument that these secular humanists are coming for us, sort of linked to all these other issues, the gay movement and all the rest, that this sort of secularism was going to overwhelm America. And if you read between the lines, it's, you know, we hold our nose, but we'll reelect Trump because he's appointing these judges and we need him to defend this and so forth and so on and so on. And I think that Bill Barr's um, stepping out that way for an attorney general, because he was AG at the time, it has that same imprint that you're talking about, you know, that before that, you might have thought things like this, but you didn't actually put a Bible on the lectern and start talking about how we're losing our Christian culture. You were a little more subtle than that. So talk yeah. to me a little more about that, just this kind of convergence of the Federalist Society, Bill Barr, Amy Coney, Barrett, these other folks who seem to have just taken even the pretense of being institutional kind of servants of the people. And now they are really not just more aggressive in what they're doing, but, but the, the, you know, I mean, hypocrisy is, is a compliment to virtue. I mean, when you're in hypocrite, you, you sort of are admitting there's a standard you're trying to keep. They're not even hypocrites anymore. They're just doing their thing. Yeah, I mean, I think um, Leonard Leo's probably a big figure in this too, um, because mm -hmm. I think if you go back far enough, there were some real tensions between the religious right and the Federalist Society, right? right. The Federalist Society's project was to create a conservative legal elite. Yes. And at times, you know, bringing in somebody like Jerry Falwell was not conducive to that, right? Because no. people in places like Harvard or Yale might have been willing to hear conservative arguments about yeah. law and economics or something, but they did not want to hear from Jerry Falwell about, you know, right. divorce or school prayer. And so for a long time, um, there had been an almost sort of like don't ask, don't tell policy within the Federalist Society when it came to abortion. They were okay sure. with people opposing abortion, but they weren't taking the lead on it. And then even when they got into it, it was usually in the, like through Robert Bork, who said, you know, Roe is yeah. the ultimate example of judicial activism, but again, not because secular humanists are coming for you. It was just sort right. of like this, there's, there's nothing, Roe is a crappy decision. There's nothing to look at there. That's why we're opposed to it. Um, and so I think what's changed over time is that people in the federal society in positions of power, and Leonard Leo is a very powerful person. He's also yeah. was on the kind of founding board of students for life, right? So these yeah. are people in positions of, in Bill Barr too, people in positions of power who, for whom being yeah. opposed to abortion is, is not, you know, a kind of side issue. It's the main agenda. That's what um, and I think that's, that's been a significant piece of why this has happened. I think yeah. another reason this has happened is that the anti-abortion movement as a whole and particularly um, the kind of evangelical wing of the movement has more influence on the Republican Party than has been the case in the past. Yes, yes, um, yes. Donald Trump was much more beholden to Christian nationalists for votes than, you know, someone like George W. Bush or George H. W. Bush, mm -hmm. in part because he was so unpopular and he didn't have, you know, he couldn't fall back on the idea that voters just liked him in the way people liked George W. Bush right. or um, 
you know, Ronald Reagan, for example. And so I think as that happened, and at the same time, I think the Republican Party demographic changes and um, political party realignment made it such that the Republican Party's real support now, that most reliable support hmm. comes from states in the South that have the highest concentration yeah, the of white evangelical Protestants. So as all of that is happening, you know, the anti-abortion movement goes from sort of the old business model where Ronald Reagan would, you know, give speeches and then not do what a lot not of anti-abortion folks wanted to a movement where, you know, a moment where anti-abortion groups are, you know, changing policy and priorities of Republicans in state legislatures and Congress and even in the White House. So mm. I think that's a big reason things are changing. The conservative legal movement's changing, but you know, who's on the court is a function not only of the conservative legal movement and who they're putting up, but the GOP and who they're voting for. And so I think both of those yeah, things. Yeah, and, I, and I think another thing that's changed too is back in our day in the 70s and 80s, we never would have presumed to show up with a list in the Oval Office, quite literally the way Ralph, <laughs> Reed, Ralph Reed and Franklin Graham did and said, you know, we can bring you millions of votes if you'll appoint these guys. Because I can remember my father talking with George Bush Sr., and Betty Ford and all these other people when they would stay in the Ford White House. And we were, we always felt very much to be the outsiders being suffered to come approach power. It was never like we are, we are now in control of the Republican Party and here's what we want you to do for us. And I think the instructive thing is that for all his lies and craziness, the one constituency Trump actually delivered exactly what was on the list to make a deal, if you like, to have the unwavering support of Franklin Graham uh, the unwavering support of Ralph Reed and everybody they represented and Paula White and these others was that, um, you know, they actually presented him with things they wanted done and he did them. Yeah, totally. I mean, I think, and I think he had to, right? I mean, yeah, of course he um, had to, if he was going to have any hope of reelection. Totally. Yeah. And I think, um, I think Trump also understood that more, right? Because his, and I think this is true of a lot of GOP candidates in recent years, the strategy has been one of turnout, right? That you excite the people who like you. Yes. And it doesn't matter if everybody else hates you. And I yeah. think in the aftermath of Dobbs, some Republicans are not sure whether that's the strategy anymore, which is why you see the kind of hilarious, like, uh, you know, yeah. like scrubbing of websites done by folks like Blake Masters. Like, I think the most entertaining interview yeah. I've had with a reporter in the past several months was, <laughs> you know, someone said, Blake Masters says he's for personhood, but now he says he's not for an abortion ban. So yeah. is, and I was like, if you're for personhood, you're kind of for an abortion ban. Like, that's basically yeah. what it means. Um, but I, I think you, you, there's maybe some tension in the contemporary GOP, at least in Senate races, as to whether the movement is going to, the party is going to be the kind of, you know, party of the base and that's it. Um, yeah, yeah. But I think that had been the Donald Trump playbook, and that has been the playbook of a lot of Republican politicians, and that's meant more influence for anti-abortion groups because, you know, they did get what they wanted and they delivered votes in return. Let me let me throw a couple things out related to Dollars for Life, the anti-abortion movement, and the fall of the Republican establishment. Um, since you have looked into this area, uh, I talk a little bit about the fact that just as the courts sort of taken their gloves off a little bit and there's less of a pretense of neutrality or, or you know, uh, originalism or anything else, uh, it's more like, hey, we're just gonna do this, we're in power, sort of a la Bill Barr. Similarly, it seems to me that um, now the Republicans are in a position to win or have won so much recently that the floodgates of money have opened. I, I mean, I can remember talking with people back in the day um, you know, f raising money and so forth. And again, there was a wariness of giving money to people who were, quote, too radical. And it just seems to me that that wariness is gone, the kind of funding that's now poured into these movements. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because you're, this is, again, an area of expertise for you. Yeah, I mean, folks will have heard of, you know, dark money. And I mean, that's mm -hmm. obviously meant to be a pejorative term. But yeah, um, one of the reasons anti-abortion groups got involved in campaign finance is because they realized that there were lots of donors, and frankly, there always were a lot of donors who would have mm -hmm. given to radical causes, but they didn't want to have to admit that they were giving to radical causes. And the reasons for this aren't hard to see. Like, for example, in California, um, there were lots of wealthy people who donated to Proposition 8, which was a measure that banned same-sex sure. marriage in California before the Supreme Court decided that wasn't okay. Um, and at the time, 
um, you know, there was a big effort to disclose who did this. So there were websites like knowthyneighbor.org where people's mm -hmm. identities were revealed and there were tremendous repercussions. Now, obviously yeah. that's California, but that's not atypical, right? They're very conservative people living um, and working in major metropolitan areas who would happily donate to radical causes as long as they don't have to disclose it. So a big part of the work on campaign finance that anti-abortion groups contributed to was one, you know, Citizens United, which um, is obviously about corporate independent expenditures, but that yeah. meant not just, you know, for profit businesses, but it also meant nonprofit, like, so think super nonprofit, super PACs, ideological nonprofit corporations. <clears throat> and even when, you know, their disclosure rules exist, if you have a group called, you know, the Coalition for a Better America or whatever, most people are not going to go to the trouble of figuring out what that is or who's behind mm -hmm. it. And, you know, at the same time, you see ongoing efforts to eliminate disclosure rules. So there's even more secrecy for donors. Um, and I think, you know, as the GOP as a whole has become more populist and more, more radical, um, donors' fear of exposure has diminished. And the rules have changed in a way that makes the fear of exposure much less immediate anyway, right? Because there's yeah. more of a sense that no one will find out if you donate to a cause that- Well, and when you introduce the, the element of fake news being the answer to anything you don't like, or- Right. <laughs> we won, <laughs> and, and, and if you lose the election, we won anyway because they were cheating- you know, now basically throw all the rules away because there aren't any. I mean, you know, we thought there were, you know, at least I thought Hillary Clinton would be elected and then Trump was. But I never even then I never foresaw a time when the result of a national election would be questioned as in, uh, you know, what has happened since. So let me yeah. let me um, use the minutes we have left here to ask you, you know, you, you know, you had talked about the fact that you hadn't foreseen certain things. From, from what you know now with these books you've been writing and the study you're doing and looking at the money flow into this the right wing, you know, how do you read, I'm not asking for election predictions, but how do you read the next 10 years of American history as it, result, as it relates to everything that grows from this, not just what happens on abortion and what women do with their vote and so on, but just everything that's growing from this, the power of the religious right, sort of a move towards theocracy, the courts not even pretending to be, you know, above the fray. How do you see this? I, I don't have an answer to that question. I'm asking you what you think. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think it's kind of just a, all of this. I think what is happening with abortion and what's happening beyond that is kind of a stress test for democracy, because you're seeing the court doing things people really don't like. Um, a lot of politicians thinking the rules of politics just don't exist anymore, and it doesn't matter if voters don't do what you like. And we're beginning to see some signs that maybe that's not going to work, right? Like the vote in mm -hmm. Kansas where voters, and Republicans mostly, and sure. were overwhelmingly rejecting the idea of, um, you know, withdrawing state constitutional abortion rights. Mm -hmm. And so I think we're at a moment, obviously, where there's a lot of people who are um, disenchanted with democracy or indifferent to democracy. Some of those are people whose primary focus is abortion or other religious mm -hmm. adjacent issues. Some of them are not. Um, and I frankly don't know what's going to happen, right? I mean, I know that there's, this is a, a moment I yeah. think where democratic norms are eroding, but, um, you know, the signs in terms of how, whether there will be a stopping point to that erosion, I think are mixed, right? Um, and mm -hmm. I, and so I, I don't, I don't know, right? I mean, which is a kind of scary place to be, it is. But, I, but I feel very uncertain about it. When you throw out, you know, this a couple, two things just as your reaction on, it, it seems to me there's been a miscalculation from the Democratic side that somehow anybody who shows up that's brown or Hispanic or something will automatically be in their camp. And you've got this aging demographic of Fox viewers and the older evangelicals. All of a sudden, a lot of uh, Democrats are waking up to the fact that a lot of those folks who have come over the border that they thought perhaps would shift things their way or the, the fertility rates on various populations. You know, you have a lot of very conservative Hispanics who are first and foremost Pentecostal Christians or Roman Catholics. Um, they do not all come in one shape and size, you know, another inconvenient fact. Uh, and the Democrats have been very good at reaching out and articulating the morality of their own position on so many issues um, to these folks. And then uh, you know, on, on the other hand, you've got this huge question, I think, looms over everything that I'd like your reaction on. And that is, well, what happens if the system itself, the electoral system itself is so undermined 
uh, not even in the obvious ways of gerrymandering, but you know, to the point of local election officials being so intimidated that the only people left on those boards are right-wing Republicans because no one else dares. I mean, I mean, I don't even want to go there. But again, it's a shocking thing. But this is actually on the table now. Yeah, I mean, that's that's really kind of the question for me. I mean, I think it's fair that you know, Trump has more, I mean, Trump appeals to a lot of people, um, and not all of the people to whom Trump appeals um, are white. Uh, and I think, you know, some of the things that Trump uh, kindles in people, even some of the racial resentments um, appeal to people who aren't white. I think the, sure. so the politics of that are complicated. I think at the same time, um, you know, and this is the interesting question, right? So if you're looking at what, what's happening now, if you take abortion just as an example, mm. um, it should be the case that Republicans who want to win should be taking positions on abortion that voters like. That doesn't mean they would have to be pro-choice, but it would mean right. they wouldn't be saying we're going to ban, you know, IUDs and we're going to punish people who are pregnant. Like some of the stuff that's on the table right now should just not be on the table if you're focusing on winning. Right, because it's that, so punitive and so ugly. Right, and nobody wants, I mean, polling on abortion is remarkably stable, right? So the sure. sort of range of what's politically okay or not is yeah. not that broad nationally and in most states. So the question I think really is, you know, is our democracy healthy enough that politicians respond to those incentives, right? That they yeah. respond to what voters want, or is the system so broken that it just carries out the policies that people who are in movements want, people who are donors want, you know, who, whether or not those represent what anybody else is thinking. Hmm. And I think the signs it's too early to say after Dobbs, but I think the signs are mixed, right? And and we we won't really know, I think, until well after 2022 or 2024, um, where that's going to head. Yeah, or whether the any election result is so challenged. Sure, for, yeah, right. Whether even election results matter, period. Yeah, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so just thinking back over our discussion here, we have a couple minutes left. What haven't I asked you that I should have and that you were hoping we would talk about and didn't? Oh, I don't know. I feel like we've talked about a lot of things. I can't think of anything that uh, that really immediately comes to mind. Okay. But... And of the books that you've written, I I feel right now, I you know, they're all so relevant to where we're at. We will post a link to everything you've done. Uh, we don't have to list the titles here because it'll be anywhere this is. And by the way, I should have halfway through this, but I got so involved in our conversation, I forgot to do things I'm supposed to do, like say, in the middle of this, again, this is Frank Schaefer. This is in conversation with Frank Schaefer. It is a live Facebook event, and then it becomes something that goes on YouTube and the three or four places podcasts can be found most easily everywhere you see this or listen to it. Uh, my guest, um, Mary Ziegler's work will be listed. And I presume, Mary, that that uh, there's a way people can uh, get in touch with you if they want to talk to you about something. I don't mean personal information, but just. Um, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, that. I mean, you can you can follow me or message me on on Twitter. I'm at Mary. We'll Arden. do all that. We'll link. We'll make um, all those links. And uh, you can find my faculty page at yeah. Davis pretty easily and my professional website. And you can email me there. Whatever you tell my redoubtable, wonderful best friend, producer Ernie, will be uh, it, he will make it so. So <laughs> okay. We'll, we'll yeah. And I'm not that. like most people who are law professors. I'm not. My email is not hard to find. And like most yeah. people who are rational, other information is hard to find. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I'm the same, by the way. I, I pretty much respond to folks. Um, but in any case, thank you so much. And uh, we, we should talk more because uh, we've scratched the surface here. So I'm going to ask Ernie to try to get back in touch with you and put you back in, in, in the loop here to, to go deeper into some of these issues and unpack more of what's in the books. Of the books that are out there right now, if where would someone start uh, to read you and what's most relevant that would be, you know, widest, uh, most accessible to folks of the books? What title do you want to pull out and just recommend? I mean, I, I think it depends on what you want to find out. I mean, if you want the sort of closest to the sort of how Roe got overturned, Dollars for Life would be the best. Yeah. Um, if you want to feel less depressed, um, probably After Row is good because I think After Row is more a look at the kind of um, more complex, less yes monolithic anti-abortion movement. So I think it depends on you know what what your goal is in reading. I would okay. Say. Well, listen. All the best to you, uh, to your mom, to your dad, um, to your husband, to your five-year-old, and um, 
take care. And I hope we talk again in the not too distant future. And thank you so much for your time and for your expertise. You know, it's wonderful to talk to someone who is uh, knows more about a field than anybody else around. And I think you're that person on this issue. So thank you so much um, and take care. Yeah, I'm happy to do it anytime. Thanks. For thank you so much. Bye, Mary. <laughs> Bye.